So RNA interference uh, is um, one of the, the most remarkable recent discoveries in science. It was discovered in 1998 uh, by uh, two scientists, Andy Farr and Craig Mello. And uh, the reason I have a particular affinity to the discovery of RNA interference is that Andy Farr was a graduate student, got his PhD with me at, the, at MIT. And uh, he was a brilliant fellow. Uh, he arrived at MIT at 19 years of age, got his PhD a few, four years later, and went off and, and had a brilliant career, has a brilliant career. But he discovered with uh, Craig Mello that uh, if you feed or inject into a simple worm, C. elegans, a double-strand RNA, that that double-strand RNA would then silence the gene from which it was made. And this was so surprising, we, we didn't know that was the case. But once we started thinking about it, and we looked back in, in literature, in the plant kingdom, uh, it had been recognized a decade before that when they introduced DNA into cells by introducing a gene into plants, frequently that gene would not be expressed, but even silence the expression of genes in the plant that it was related to. And that they called due to aberrant RNA and the aberrant RNA turned out to be making a double-strand RNA structure that silenced genes in plants. And in that plant, and particularly due to the work of uh, David Balcom, uh, they recognized that the way plants protect themselves against viruses was to use double-strand RNA as a key to recognize viral infections make that double-strand RNA, amplify it, spread it through the plant, and make the plant resistant to the double-strand RNA. So this whole RNA interference process was used in plants to protect them against pathogens, particularly RNA viruses that infect, infect plants. But now we have this tool, or this concept or discovery, that double-strand RNA in some cells could be used to silence a gene. And there had to be a mechanism that would take this RNA and silence a gene. And uh, uh, then with David Bartell, uh, Phil Zane-Moore, two postdocs at MIT, David Bartell, a faculty member, and myself, we started to, to uh, see if we could devise the, a biochemical process where we could study this pathway between the double-strand RNA and what would silence a gene. And Tom Tushel and Phil Zamor uh, set up the first experiment, uh, uh, and they added little double-strand RNA to a test tube reaction, and saw that in that test tube reaction, it was inactivating the uh, translation of a given messenger RNA. And uh, that uh, told us that we were reproducing in this test tube the reaction between double-strand RNA and an intermediate that paired to the message and, and destroyed the message. So we knew we had the reaction in a test tube, and then we started studying the reaction and trying to figure out uh, what was the nature of that intermediate between the double-strand RNA. And it turned out to be in uh, small RNAs, RNAs that are called uh, small interfering RNAs, and in 2000, 2001, Tom Tushel cloned uh, these small RNAs and discovered they had a specific structure, uh, 21 base pairs, two base pair overhangs, very specific structure, and chemically made those RNAs and showed that in human cells, those RNAs would also, the small RNA would also silence a gene. So that told us that in our cells, we have the biochemical machinery to take these small RNAs, 
incorporate them into a biochemical machinery and pair it with a message and cut the message. And we've since uh, discovered, and others have discovered, but David Bartel, and uh, in particular with Tasho, um, discovered that the reason that these RNAs work in our cells is that we have a uh, set of genes encoded in our genome, about 500 to 1,000, which we again didn't know they existed until about 2,000, that make small RNAs. They're called microRNAs in our cells, and those microRNAs regulate genes in, in our cells, and those are terribly important. Uh, if you have defects in microRNAs, uh, that can cause everything from mental diseases to abnormal development to a host of, of different uh, problems. And actually, loss of activity of these microRNAs is a major contributor to cancer. So we have a biochemical machinery in our cells that take these uh, small RNAs and pair them in, uh, in a functional way with, with their target message. And that makes the whole system efficient if you can get the RNA into the cell. Now, if you think about this, I've told you if I know the structure of a gene, I can make a small RNA that would silence a gene. And in our cells, we have the machinery to take that RNA and silence a gene. So it offered us then uh, an ideal opportunity to treat diseases by making small RNAs, introducing them into cells, and have them silence genes that cause the disease. So that's something we've been about trying to, to develop for the last 10 years. So we established a, a company, all four of us, David Bartel, myself, Tushel, and, and Zamor, called Al Nylum, that's located in Boston, Massachusetts, it, specifically in Cambridge, right next to MIT, where we have uh, uh, worked on research to develop very uh, efficient processes to deliver these small RNAs in patients so that it would be taken up by patient cells and treat disease. And we've devised two processes that, that do that. In one case, we incorporate the small RNAs into a, a lipid particle, a nanoparticle, a very small particle, that can pass through your blood system, pass out of the blood system to the cells, and be taken up by the cells, and the lipid surface of those particles fuse with the membranes of the cells and release the small RNAs into the cells. And we're in a, a clinical studies uh, testing this process in uh, the, to see if it's effective in treating a, a disease that causes cardiac failure and actually uh, neuronal failure. So uh, we've treated probably 500 to 1,000 patients. Uh, it's safe. Uh, it looks like we're having, uh, well, we are having the effect of silencing the gene. And uh, we're trying to see if it actually helps those patients. Uh, we have another method which we can chemically join uh, these small RNAs to a, a sugar, uh, something that your body makes all the time. And we can introduce that by simply injection in, under the skin in a sub-Q uh, way, just like you take insulin for diabetes. And uh, that is taken up efficiently by the, the liver. And uh, it's a very convenient, a very safe way to use these small RNAs. And we're quite excited because I think we're going to be able to treat a whole host of diseases. Uh, everything from uh, hemophiliac, where you, you have blood clotting defects, uh, to metabolism, where you have cholesterol at high levels that cause heart failure, uh, to inflammation where you have complement that re is activated in your body and you get a, a, a complement uh, uh, attack, which is uh, lethal in some cases. Uh, 
through just a whole host of, of different conditions, all of which uh, occur in, uh, due to genes that are expressed in the liver. So this whole process uh, between the discovery in 1998 and now 2014, which is 16 years, is a very rapid adoption of a discovery in science, in life science. So you make a discovery, you try to figure out how you can make it useful, and then you have to perfect it in patients and in animal models to see if it works. And then you have to go through clinical trials to show that you're actually impacting on the disease in the patient and making the patient better. And that whole process can take a decade or more. Uh, and we are fortunate that we have been able to uh, obtain enough investment and relationships with pharmaceutical companies to be able to progress through all of that, to actually have a chance of changing how pe people are treated in diseases. And this is an ideal technology because as our genome is being sequenced and disease genes are being identified, we now have the ability to make a small RNA to a disease gene and in doing that, treat the disease directly. So it's a, it's a very uh, uh, useful and, and it will be a very useful and a very effective way of treating human genetic diseases. Right.